And today we'll um, work on unit one, lesson 20, determine the narrative point of view. Um, so it's uh, really straightforward um, and how we, I, but we have in the past uh, talked about point of view and it's been a little bit more about perspective. Uh, you know, like somebody's opinion when we state something about you. But in this case, it's much more about the literal perspective that we have, uh, when we're telling a story. That's what's going on here, all right? And so by the time you complete this lesson, you will be able to identify an omniscient point of view and identify a first person point of view. And we'll get an explanation for both of those here. Okay, so here's our audio. A story is told from a particular point of view. It may be told by an omniscient or all-knowing narrator who knows the thoughts and feelings of all the characters. Or it may be told by a first-person narrator, a character who is part of the story. A first-person narrator does not know the thoughts and feelings of other characters. First-person narrators use I as they tell the story. Omniscient narrators use he, she, they, or characters' names. Both kinds of writing can affect how a reader receives information about a story. An omniscient point of view lets the reader know what multiple characters are thinking or feeling. A first-person narrative requires the reader to rely on a single character's perception of events and other characters. So here's another one of those words that, uh, you know, you can look for a little clue when, when you see it, omni. Uh, anytime you see that as a, as a, as a uh, prefix or the root of a word, it's Latin for all. And so here, you know, it's all knowing, like it says, you'll see omnipotent, like all powerful or omnipresent, which is always present or always there. We often hear those words when we describe uh, deities and gods, you know, like in, in modern religion stuff, God is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent. Um, so that'll help you remember, you know, that, that idea and omniscient uh, perspective when we're talking about narration, right, is all knowing. So you can kind of think of it like God or, or deity looking down uh, and, and they know the thoughts in everybody's head. They know uh, the actions that are taking place. And that's, that is the point of view. Um, and the best way to remember that is the pronouns used in the story. So they're going to use he, she, and they, right? Every time they describe somebody, it's gonna be he, they, or she, or, or some form of those pronouns. First person, on the other hand, <clears throat> and um, you know, like uh, really popular, like in video games, uh, we know like uh, games like Call of Duty and Battlefield and all this, they call them first person shooters because you're taking the perspective of one person and you're looking through their eyes. Uh, and that's first person. First person narrator is, is one individual and everything that they see. So the thing about that point of view is that they'll use the pronoun I. So if a narrator is using I, then they're only able to know their own thoughts and what they can see through their own eyes. Whereas omniscient means you know everybody's ideas, thoughts, and everything all of the time all-knowing. So we'll see that in action here with our examples in our quiz and our workbook. <clears throat> workbook. <clears throat> so our first passage here says, a man awaits execution. And uh, he says, he closed his eyes in order to fix his last thoughts upon his wife and children. The water touched to the gold the water touched to gold by the early sun, the brooding mists under the banks at some distance down the stream, the fort, the soldiers, the piece of drift, all had distracted him. He unclosed his eyes and saw again the water below him. If I could free my hands, he thought, I might throw off the noose and spring into the stream. If 
By diving, I could evade the bullets and swimming vigorously reach the bank, take to the woods and get away home. My home, thank God, is that is as yet outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invaders' farthest advance. As these thoughts, which have there, which have here to be set down in words, were flashed into the doomed man's brain, rather than evolved from it, the captain nodded to the sergeant. The sergeant stepped aside. So, what we have underlined here in the first uh, first sentence. Uh, it says the pronouns he and his indicate that the story is told from an omniscient point of view. The narrator informs the reader about the man's situation and thoughts. So it doesn't say I closed my eyes in order to fix my last thoughts, right? That would have been first person. Here he's using he closed his eyes. So that way we know it's omniscient. Uh, and then are underlined in the, in the second paragraph there says the narrator makes clear that the thoughts and actions are being set down in words by the narrator, not by the man in the story. So as these thoughts, which have here to be set down in words. So that's coming from the narrator, the omniscient narrator. Um, that's from an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, which is probably one of the most famous um, American short stories. <laughs> and it's funny that my wife and I were talking about this just, uh, I think it was right before Christmas, and we were talking to our daughter about some famous short stories that we liked and that we read uh, in school. And we both were, were talking about this one, and we couldn't remember the, the title of it. And then I'm sitting down earlier, and I'm, and I'm, I'm you know, doing some prep for today, and I look, and I'm like, look over and I'm like, it was an occurrence at Owl Creek. <laughs> she's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's it. So yeah, it's, it's really famous. It's also, you could probably tell uh, about a, uh, it's set during the Civil War. It was written by a Civil War veteran. Uh, and our, our person that's focused on is a plantation owner. He's a civilian, but he's a slave owner and a plantation owner who's, who's going to be hanged off a bridge. So let's take a look at our quiz. And then uh, it says here in dialogue, characters other than the narrator may refer to themselves as I or me. Uh, this language does not show point of view the pronouns outside the quotation reveal how the narrator refers to the character. And we have that here, right? He unclosed his eyes and saw again the water below him. If I could free my hands, he thought. I might throw off the noose and spring into the stream. So he's not, he's not, you know, he is thinking this. The quotations are about his thoughts. It's not actual words either. All right. Um, so question one, Tracy, would you like to read question one for us? Yes. In the second paragraph, the narrator includes a quotation. Why is this information voted? A, the quotation indicates that these are the exact thoughts <clears throat> of the man in the story. B, the quotation is included because the man in the story is speaking to the captain. See, the quotation is included because the narrator has overheard the man say these words. D, the quotation show that the narrator is sipping from the bus to the press, the present. B. So A, the quotation A. indicates that these are the exact thoughts. So the thing about quotations, and um, we're going to get into that more when it comes time to, you know, when we start writing and we start doing some other type of writing exercise and stuff. So anytime you see quotations, it basically is telling you uh, one of maybe two or three things. First off, anything in quotations is exact language. Um, it is, and if it's, something that has been cited from another source. So that's where, you know, it might come into play for us in, in writing where you're quoting 
a uh, passage from something that you've just read uh, and you want to use that exact language. And you also do that to make sure that you're not plagiarizing, right? You, you cite something, you quote it from its source and um, you use the exact um, you know, wordage uh, that is, is found in the passage. Um, and then secondly, it's, it's most common when somebody is speaking. So, you know, in, in writing, uh, in, you know, so like fiction writing, it's gonna be the words or thoughts of somebody. So just, you know, that's the perfect example here. He is thinking and the, this is his exact thoughts that's coming through. If I could free my hands, comma, quotation, he thought. So that's where they're going to appear. <laughs> All right, so one is A. Um, two, a new paragraph here. Uh, Grace, would you like to read the paragraph for us? Is it just that Grace? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. During my, okay, read the passage. Mm -hmm. Read yeah. each question and choose the best answer. Sundays and holidays. During my holidays from school, I was allowed to stay in bed until long after my father had gone to work. He left our house every weekday at the stroke of seven by the Anglican church bell. I would lie in bed awake and I could hear all the Sunday, Sundays sound my parents make. Excuse me. <laughs> Okay. Some my parents made as they prepare for the day. As they prepare for the day ahead. As my mother made my father his breakfast, my father will shave using, using his shaving brush that had that had an ivory handle and a razor that much matched. Then he will step outside to the little shed he had built for us as a bathroom to quickly bath in to quickly bath in water that he had entrusted my mother to leave outside overnight in the dew. That way, the water would the the water will be very cold and. And he believed that cold water strengthened his, his back. If I had been a boy, I would have gotten the same treatment. But since I was a girl, and on top of that, went to school only with other girls, my mother will always add some hot water to my bath water to take off the chill. On Sunday afternoons, while I was in Sunday school, my father took a hot bath. The tub was half filled with, with plain water. And then my mother will add a large cauldron full of water in which she had just bought some bark and leaves from a bay leaf tree. The bark and leaves were there for no reason other than he liked the smell. He would then spend hours lying in this bath studying his pool coupons or drawing examples of pieces of furniture he had he planned to make. When I came home from Sunday school, he will sit down to our Sunday dinner. We will sit down to our Sunday dinner. You want to read the question for us too? Okay. From whose point of view is the passage told? A, pa their parents, B, the fathers. C, the mothers, and D, the girls, D. Yep, the girls, right? We pretty obvious there. And, right, we know this is first person uh, really quickly because uh, right there in the first sentence, we have the pronoun I. I was allowed to stay in bed. So that's a single person where we're looking through this girl's eyes in this passage. Uh, Christiana, you want to read number three for us? Okay, number three, um, the passage says, I would lie in bed awake and I could hear all the sound my parents 
made as they prepare for the day ahead. What does the pronoun I indicate? Um, A, the story is first, it's a first person account. Um, B, or, or, I mean, uh, is that word? Omniscient. Oh, an um, omnis, omnis, an om, omniscient narrator is telling a story. See, all the mother's thoughts would be revealed. D, reader would, would not know the girl's thoughts or feelings. Um, B? It's A, it's first person. Yeah. I always think about first person is is looking through their eyes and what they're what they're um, experiencing. So we're looking through the girl's eyes here. A four three and number four. Etta, you would like to read number four for us. Which statement best explains the author's purpose in presenting this point of view? A, to provide insight into a family's feelings. B, to analyze a father's bathing habits. C, to present the thoughts and feelings of one young girl. Or D, to explain what young girls think about their parents. I think it's C, as in cat. C, as in cat. All right, it's uh, thoughts and feelings of one young girl. That's what we're getting here. That's her point of view. And number five, Tracy, could you read number five for us? Yes. Uh, the daughter's account of her parents most resemble uh, a journalist objective account of a current event, b diary writer's explanation of daily events in a family, c power's expression of personal feeling about family relationship, d mystery writer's revelation. Mm -hmm. Of uh, close about a crime. Um, B. B. Right. It's it, you can almost hear, you know, her say, "Dear diary." Right. <laughs> you could start this this whole section with "Dear diary." I was allowed to stay in bed until long after my father had gone to work. You know, it, it's it almost sounds like a journal or something that's that's being written here. All right. So yeah, five. Uh, B is in boy for our last question for the quiz there. So one was A, two D as a dog, three A, four C, five B. And I think you you know could start seeing you know the idea here, right? We're seeing the use of I in first person, and we're seeing the he, she, uh, or they pronouns for omniscient. And we'll get some more practice here with the workbook. <clears throat> and it's like I said, it's, you know, really just two ideas that we're working with today, just identifying, you know, where, you know, one lies, is it, is it with this, there are um, multiple mm -hmm. points of view that you could write from uh, that, but this is where you start. Mm -hmm. um, there's like a limited omniscient mm -hmm. that deals with, you know, only the point of view of one character at a time. Uh, and you know, there's other types, but uh, it, once you learn these two, um, then you get a good sense of, of, of you know, all types of, of, of uh, fictional writing and, and narration. So as it says here, any story is shaped by the narrator or person who tells it. The narrator's point of view determines the perspective readers will have on events. An omniscient narrator knows all, or most of the information contained in a story. A first-person narrator provides only a partial view of events, the way he or she sees or interprets them. Analyzing the point of view of a story will help you identify who is telling a story and how the narrator's method of storytelling affects a tale. And that's, you know, really particularly with first-person, um, <clears throat> you know, identifying that you know, basically that first person is a character in the story. Whereas with omniscient, the narrator is outside of the storytelling. All right, and another section from an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. So uh, it says here on the gallows. 
um, a man stood upon a railroad bridge in northern Alabama, looking down into the swift water 20 feet below. The man's hands were tied behind his back. The wrists bound with a cord. A rope closely encircled his neck. It was attached to a stout cross timber above his head, and the slack fell to the level of his knees. Some loose boards laid upon the ties supporting the rails of the railway supplied a footing for him and his executioners. Two private soldiers of the Federal Army, directed by a sergeant who in civil life may have been a deputy sheriff, at a short remove distance upon the same temporary platform was an officer in the uniform of his rank, armed. He was a captain. A sentinel at each end of the bridge stood with his rifle in a position known as support, that is to say, vertical in front of the left shoulder, the hammer resting on the forearm thrown straight across the chest, a formal and unnatural position enforcing an erect carriage of the body. It did not appear to the duty of these two men to know what was occurring at the center of the bridge. They merely blockaded the two ends of the foot planking that traversed it. So, uh, yeah, once again, you know, dealing with what's obviously going to be a hanging, they're going to hang this man. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, a couple tip offs is about the Civil War. You hear Federal Army. So this is the, you know, the, the, the Union Army that's going to hang this man. Uh, and also it says, you know, may have been uh, a sergeant in civil life, may have been a deputy sheriff. So you know that he's, uh, you know, part of the Army. Um, and it's also a, a train bridge, right? We can tell that because they're talking about the the uh, the tracks and the ties there. So it says first that the narrator's language is detached. Uh, describing the scene is as an observer might. This objectivity indicates that the story is told by an omniscient narrator. So that's another way to look at it, right? As an observer. So I was saying, you know, looking above uh, and, and knowing everything that's happening at once. That's where the idea behind omniscience. And then secondly, it says a first person narrator could also describe all the details, but they would be based on the narrator's perceptions of them. So you could, you know, have the same story told through the perspective of the, uh, the, the, the man being hanged, the man that's being executed, um, but everything has to occur through his eyes and his senses and how he perceives things. All right, so let's start the workbook and again so it says here when a character narrating a story refers to himself or herself as i the story is told from first person point of view a narrator who knows the thoughts of all the characters is omniscient it's you know kind of restating this in, in several ways but that's you know your 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 tip offs uh, you know, the use of pronouns uh, and, and what the narrator knows. How much do they know about the situation? Okay. Um, Grace, could you read number one for us? <clears throat> Grace? Grace. Uh, I was reading. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. In the, the, the narrator provides information about A, what characters think, B, how characters feel, C, why events are taking place, and D, what the scene looks like. B? D. D. Yeah, D. D. Yeah. What the scene looks like. Um, yeah, this this uh, you know we we dealt with setting here recently, right? Analyzing setting. That's that's this is. I don't know if this. I can't remember if this is the very beginning of the story, but it certainly sounds like it, right? A man stood upon a railroad bridge in northern Alabama, looking down into the swift water, twenty feet uh, uh, below. The man's hands were tied. All that setting, um, which we talked about. So, yeah, one is D as in dog. Uh, Two, Christiana, could you read two for us? Number two. If the man, 
if the man about to be executed were describing his sin, he most likely would include the sin. Um, okay. The sense, the sense, no. Yeah. Okay, feelings about execution. B, his own thoughts and feelings about the, about his, his situation. C, the executioner feelings about the attacks. D, the captain's thoughts about the event. Um, is it A? It's B. So if we were, yeah, if we were in first person, uh, then we may get more insight into the narrator's ideas himself, right? If the man to be executed was describing a scene, he would probably be talking about what he is experiencing. So that would be his thoughts and feelings about the situation. So two is B. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. New passage here from Little Women. Um, Etta, you want to take the first paragraph for us? Okay. Joe was the first to wake in the gray dawn of Christmas morning. Those stockings hung at the fireplace, and for a moment she felt as much disappointed as she did long ago. When her little sock fell down because it was cramped so full of goodies, then she remembered her mother's promise and slipping her hand under the, her pillow, drew out a little crimson covered book. She knew it very well, for it was that beautiful old story of the best life ever lived. And Joe felt that it was a true guidebook for any pilgrim going on a long journey. She woke Meg with a Merry Christmas and bade her see what was under her pillow. A green covered book appeared with the same picture inside and a few words written by their mother, which made their one present very precious in their eyes. Presently, Beth and Amy woke to rummage and find their little books also. One dove, one dove colored the other blue and all sat looking at and talking about them while the east grew rosy with the coming day. Okay. Um, Tracy, you want to take the, the next two paragraphs? Yes. In spite of her small final states, uh, Margaret had a sweet and pious nature, which uncons unconsciously influenced her sister, especially Yo, who loved her every tenderly and obeyed her because her advice was so gently given. Go ahead and read the next one too. Yes. Ross said Max seriously, looking from the tumbled head beside her to the two little night kept ones in the room beyond. Mother wants her to read and love and mind these books. And we must begin at once. We must be fearful about it. But since father went away and on this world trouble unsettled us, we have ne neglected many things. You can do as you please. But I saw keep my book on the table here and read a little every morning as soon as I wake. For I know it will do me good and help me through the day. All right, um, and Grace, you want to read question three for us? Sure. The narrator in the passage knows that Joe is disappointed about the lack of presence and that Margaret has a sweet and pious nature, paragraph two. The narrator in the story is A, Joe. B, Margaret, C, Omniscient, and then D, First Person. Is it B? 
I think it's C. It's C, yeah. The, no, the narrator it's C. It's is all-knowing. Yeah, C, omniscient. That you, we can, you know, we know everything that's going on in, in the same moment there. They're omniscient. Okay, and let's see. Uh, Christiana, could you read four? Um, okay. okay. Margaret is described as having small vicinity. Vanities. Vanities, paragraph two, according to the um, passage. Who, who has his perspective? Who has his perspective, perspectives about Margaret? A. The director B. Joe. C. Maggie's mother. Um, D. Um, Beth. Um, and please, this um, number four. So it's it's A. The narrator. So if we look, um, it, in in this case, the, the narrator is saying, in spite of her small vanity. So for starters, we see that pronoun her. So we know it's the narrator talking. It's the omniscient here. Um, Margaret had a sweet and pious nature. Had the narrator said something like, um, Joe believed uh, Margaret had small vanities, you know, then it would be from the perspective of Joe. But since it just goes, it just rolls right into that, we know it's the, the just the narrator, the omniscient narrator. Um, and vanities uh, is like, um, you know, vanity. So they're, you know, kind of exceptionally proud of their uh, appearance or their achievements, you know, a little bit vain, um, but it doesn't affect Margaret to the degree that it, it's a, um, a, a real detriment to her, you know, character, but she has small vanity. So she is kind of proud of herself and her achievements, All right? So A, the narrator, for number four, uh, Etta, you want to read number five for us? Okay, by using this point of view, the mm -hmm. author most likely intended to A, provide insight into the reading habits of girls in the 1800s, B, analyze the girls' reactions to their Christmas gifts, C, reveal Joe's despair at the family's lack of money, or D, present the thoughts of all the characters. Um, is it C? It's D. You get all thoughts of all the characters with that omniscient narration, right? So, um, yeah, th those all kind of come into play there. <clears throat> all right. And number six. Um, uh, Tracy, you want to read number six for us? Yes. In the last slide, uh, it's a uh, Max says, I shall keep my book on the table here and read a little every morning, for I know it will do me good. How does this statement support the narrator's point of view about Meg? Meg's statement show that she has small vanities as the narrator had derived. B. Meg's statement show that Matt is no longer disappointed. See, Matt's testament shows that she is sweet and pious as the nature had deprived her. The Matt's testament show her feeling that the book is a true guide book. D? Um, C. C. She's uh, sweet and pious. So pious is like, well, there's a couple of definitions there. It, you know, it can be just devoutly religious if you're extremely pious, right? Um, like, uh, or it could be um, sort of um, sincere, uh, and, but it can also be sort of judgmental with your um, sort of like with your um, uh, sort of making a hypocritical judgment. So, but that's showing, you know, that um, it, it also kind of falls into her, you know, small vanity. So she is sweet, 
she is um, maybe, you know, sort of devout. Um, so that's the idea there. She's, she's making a statement that she's fairly genuine with her statement here about, you know, her appreciation of the book as a gift. So C is in cat for six. And let's see, I'll go ahead and read this short so here. So number seven, the narrator yeah, I'm describes Connie. Um, so her name was Connie. She was 15 and she had a quick nervous giggling habit of craning her neck to glance into mirrors or checking other people's faces to make sure her own was all right. Her mother who noticed everything and knew everything and who hadn't much reason any longer to look at her own face, always scolded Connie about it. Stop gawking at yourself. Who are you? You think you're so pretty? She would say. Connie would raise her eyebrows at those familiar complaints and look right through her mother into a shadowy vision of herself as she was right at the moment. She knew she was pretty and that was everything. So that's from Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? by like Joyce uh, Carol Oates in 1967. Um, so our question then is, this passage is written from what point of view? I have our two choices here. Is it the omniscient? Yeah, it's omniscient, right? A uh, O M N I S C I E N T. Omniscient. And our Next, fill in the blank. So does the narrator reveal the thoughts and actions of one character or two characters in this passage? Two? Yeah, two. T-W-O. Yeah, he gives us perspective on both of those characters. Uh, you know, and again, check the pronouns. So her, we start with her name was Connie. She was 15 and she had a quick nervous giggling habit. So there's, you know, one tip off of the, of the pronouns there. And then her mother, who noticed everything and knew everything and who hadn't much reason any longer to look at her own face. So we're getting information about both those characters. All right. And let's see, new, new passage here. Um, let's see, Grace. Could you read maybe the first four paragraphs? Okay. Dexter watches the girl. Okay. She had come eagerly out onto the coast at, at nine o'clock with a white lining nest and five small new golf clubs in a white canvas bag, which the nest was carrying. When Dexter fell, first saw her, she, she was standing by the caddy house, rather ill at ease and trying to conceal the fact by engaging her nurse in an obviously unnatural conversation grazed by starting an irrelevant grumps from herself. Well, it's certainly a nice day, Hilda. Desta heard her say. She, she drew down the corners of her mouth smiled and glanced furtively around. The smile again, radiant, blatantly artificial, convincing. I don't know what we are supposed to do now, said the nurse, looking nowhere in particular. All right, Christiane, you want to read the rest from five and six. Oh, wait, she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the uh edda you want to read that sure okay so you said five and six right yeah oh that's all right i'll fix it up dexter stood perfectly still his mouth slightly ajar he knew that if he moved for a step his stare would be in her line of vision if he moved backward he would lose his full vision i mean his full view of her face for a moment he had not realized how young she was. Now he remembered having seen her several times the year before in Bloomers. All right, uh, and go ahead and read the question for us too. Okay, and the expert, the little girl's smile is radiant, 
blankly artificial convincing. The, this description indicates that the narrator A knows only the thoughts of the nurse, B knows the girl's thoughts, C can describe the girl's actions, not her feelings, or D will describe will describe the girl sympathetically. Mm. B. So that's one of those kind of, uh, you know, look at the context of the questions. So the narr we're dealing with omniscience, right? Uh, we know that the, the narrator, again, knows all. Um, so that kind of rules out the first one because, you know, that would indicate that it's, it's first person. If it only knows the nurse's thoughts, then that would be first person perspective through the nurse. Um, can describe the girl's actions, not her feelings. Well, that would also indicate first person. And then we'll describe the girl sympathetically. That's not really relevant here. Um, so we know that B then will be the correct answer. So B is a boy. Uh, Tracy, you want to take number 10? Yes. If the this tell was a, nat, a narrator of this passage, he would A, be unable to overhear the girls talking, B, use the pronouns she and he to define the scene. C, use the pronoun I to define his feeling. D, he, uh, be able to hear on of the conversion between the girl and the nurse. Um, B? C. C? Yeah, if it was him, he would have to use the pronoun I. Uh, to just well, basically, you know, any anything that he's you know, uh, you know, telling us about um, through his eyes. So he, he's going to use that for his thoughts and feelings and what he's seeing. So the pronoun I ten is C, and then uh, a tutor of refugees. Uh, Grace, you want to take the first two paragraphs? Okay. Oscar Gosner cites uh, Oscar Gosner sits in his cotton mesh undershirt and summer bathrobe at the window of his stuffy hot dark hotel room on Western Street at as I cautiously knock. Outside across the sky, a late June green twilight face in darkness. The refugee fumbles for the light and stares at me. I was in those days a poor student and will brashly attempt to teach anybody anything for a bag of uh, although I have since learned better. Mostly I gave English lessons to recently arrived refugees. The college sent me. I had acquired a little experience. Already a few of my students were trying their broken English, theirs and mine in the American marketplace. I was then just 20 on my way into my senior year in college. A skinny life hungry kid, eating himself waiting for the next world war to start. It was a cheat. Here I was palpitating to get going and across the ocean Adolf Hitler in black boots and a square mustache was staring up all the flowers. Will I ever forget what went on with Danzig that summer? All right. Etta, you want to take the last paragraph there? Okay. Times will still times were still hard from the depression, but anyway, I made a little living from the poor refugees. They were all over Uptown Broadway in 1939. I have four, I had tutored. Carl Otto Up, the farmer. Film star Wolfgang Novak, once a brilliant economist, Frederick Wilhelm Wolf, who had taught medieval history at Hennyburg. And after that night, I met him in his disordered cheap hotel room. Oscar Grasser, the Berlin critic and journalist at one time on the Arch Er Abedet, 
Yeah, it's, were... <laughs> it's German, so you get real aggressive with this. Ach, er, Abendblatt. So, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. They were accomplished men. I had my nerve associated with them, but that's what a world crisis does for people. They get educated. Who All is right. the nar- oh. Yeah, go ahead. Who is the narrator of the story? A, Oscar Gassner, B, Frederick Wilhelm Wolf, C, a college student, or D, a former film star? Is it B? It, C. So we, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, he's a college student. Uh, and he's, you know, teaching like English lessons and, and things like that there. Uh, and uh, is uh, uh, that's German for eight o'clock, eight, eight, eight o'clock evening newspaper and something like that. So it's like a you know, there used to be uh, a lot of evening newspapers, you'd have a morning edition and then you have an evening edition. Um, and this, you know, is what it's stating here is all these people, uh, were, you know, wrote uh, work for this newspaper. Um, and you know, you got to make fun of uh. The German language. There's there's some great videos on YouTube where they compare German words to like other other languages. So you know they'll they'll pick a word like butterfly, and they'll have like you know they'll have somebody in English saying it, and they have somebody in French, and they have some other language, and then they have the German, and he's all like Schmetterling. Um, so you know <laughs> it's always kind of fun. Uh, but anyway, for the next one, twelve. Uh, Tracy, you want to read 12 for us? Yes. Okay, that's no thoughts and actions are revealed through A, the other language students, B, Ocas Gardner himself, C, the refugee, D, the student, C, C. 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 Yeah, D. 12 is D, D. The student. Yeah. So Oscar Gastner's thoughts and actions are revealed through the student. So this is, you know, obviously we're dealing with first person uh, and that, that first person narrator is, is a student. Uh, and, you know, again, looking at that tip off. So statements like I was in those days a poor student um, is telling you, you know, who the narrator is by the use of that I pronoun. All right, and 13, Grace, you want to read 13 for us. All right. On the basis of the point of view of the passage, what information is most likely to be included later in the story? A, thoughts of the students learning English. B, the thoughts and feelings of other German refugees. C, anything seen or thought by the college student. And D, the feelings but not the thoughts of the story's characters. C, C. right, just the college student. We can only um, witness things through his eyes because of of the first person perspective there. So anything seen or thought by him. So anything that he says uh, uh, about one of the other characters is is basically his perspective on that character what he thinks about that character or how he views that character right and 15 i'm sorry 14 uh etta you want to take 14 okay paragraph two includes the statement i was in those days a poor student and would brashly attempt to teach anybody anything for a buck an hour although i have since learned better what does this quotation reveal about the narrator's perspective on the events in the story a the narrator cannot be trusted because he will do or say anything for money b the narrator has a high opinion of himself C, the narrator is writing about events in the past and has learned much since that time. Or D, the narrator has a negative opinion of how he behaved when he was younger. I'm going to say A or D. It's C. Uh, C is in cat. So, yeah, um, th- this is something else that it, we didn't talk about a lot in, the, in, in uh, this um, exercise, but it could also... 
if it's a first person narration, uh, it could be he, that person could be discussing about an event that happened in the past. Right. And uh, your tip off there is like it, it says here, I was, you know, in those days, a poor student. So it's obviously that, you know, the narrator is talking about something that has happened in the past. Um, so you got to watch out for, you know, things like that sometimes. So the narrator, in this case, writing about events in the past and, um, you know, talking the way he talks about himself as well. So uh, he's also, you know, uh, talking about how uh, he acted. So I was a poor student and I would brashly attempt to teach anybody anything for a buck an hour. So he's being critical of him of himself. Uh, so see there. And then Tracy, our last question, 15. Yes. 15. With the narrator's qualities, does the point of view emphasize a should be appearance? See, uh, stylism, the despair, uh, uh, be appearance. So a you. A. Yeah. He's he's looking and kind of looking right back at that at that same uh, <coughs> same passage uh, in paragraph two. Uh, I was a and I was in those days a poor student of a brashly attempt to teach anybody. So it, it all kind of indicates his youth and a lack of experience, uh, you know, and, and a young person. So fifteen is a. All right. So that's the last one. Does anybody need, need me to follow up on any of the answers? Okay, well, I think I need seven. Was it narrator point of view? Omniscient for number you said, seven. What was it? Omniscient, O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N-T. Okay, and then the second one was two characters. I mean, number eight. <laughs> 